Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Relationships. They make up every human interaction and activity in our lives. Not only are they just a part of life, God made them integral into who we are. In God's Word, we find the ultimate guide in navigating conflict, relating to others, repairing broken relationships, and letting go of your past. Let's dive deep into the wisdom of God and get real. Well, good morning. So good to see all of you here today. Welcome to the conclusion of our series we are calling Get Real. And first, I always like to take a second and just welcome those watching online with us. Uh, I, I know there's hundreds of you around the world. In fact, I had a man call me just the other day, and he was from North Carolina, and he was saying, he, he, just long story short, he was so blessed to be able to join us for one of our online services. He said he felt he could hear you guys, and he felt like he was right in the room with us. And he told me that Jesus began, through the message and through the worship, that, worship, that Jesus began to change some things in his life and began to release him some, from some things that were holding him hostage for decades. So isn't that awesome? So I just want, let's put our hands together. Welcome those joining us online. We're so glad you're here. God bless you. And yeah, we're glad you're here. So this week, as I said, we're going to conclude our series we are calling Get Real. And over the past six weeks, we have been looking at how to make relationships in our lives really start to count, how to make them begin to count. Well, that's what I want to do today. I want to kind of focus in on this idea of making relationships count. You know, today I will talk about how to repair broken relationships, but as I was preparing for this message, I felt like the Lord wanted me to kind of get at the roots of relationships, to kind of get at the heart of what makes relationships tick and how to make them work. Is that okay if I do that? I'm going to go get at the roots of this. So, and that's because I don't want you to just know how to repair a relationship. I want you to know how to initiate and nurture meaningful relationships. Meaningful relationships. That's a big key difference we're going to talk about. Okay, so I think one of the most important decisions you will have in your life has to do with relationships. And that's because relationships, they shape you. You are the sum total of your relationships, good or bad. You are who you are and you are where you are because of relationships. So, Therefore, relationships are, a, making those decisions, are, it's a big deal. It's huge. It's got some weight to it. Relationship decisions are big. So a lot of people kick back, though, when they hear, oh, relationships. I don't want to talk about relationships because they've had bad relationships. Well, I'm telling you, all of us have had bad relationships. We've all experienced pain. We've all experienced death. We've all experienced brokenness. All of us have. We've all had bad relationships. But what happens is people... They experience these bad relationships, and then they conclude that, you know, and the world's helping tell them this too, but they conclude that the most important relationship is me. I got to look out for me. I got to watch my back. That's what the world tells them. But what happens is when they start thinking like this, when they get this attitude, everything else becomes disposable. My marriage becomes disposable. Your kids become disposable. You know, I like you, family member, but don't you cross that line because you're disposable too. Boss, I'm loyal, but don't you get too close to that line. You're disposable. People get into this mode where they're just, I got to look out for number one, numero uno, I got to watch my back. And that's what the world is telling them. And you know, I want to share a sad reality with you. It's because of this that I think more today than ever before in history, people are more connected today than they ever have been, yet they're more alone than they ever have been. You see that with phones, we're so connected. I can call anybody on my phone, yet people choose to take selfies. You know, people, it's inward focused. They're alone. That's the reality behind it. You know, people probably did that as kind of a knee reaction to protect themselves. Hey, I got to protect myself it's because of those bad relationships, those things that happened. Hey, I'm just trying to protect myself. But really, it hasn't helped you. It hasn't helped you a bit. In fact, it's hurt you. Okay, it's hurt you. I want to share a verse with you that is very powerful. And this verse isn't on your outlines, but if you want to look up at the screens and follow along with me, it's out of the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's written by the wisest man to ever live, and that's Solomon. It says, There was a man all alone, 
and he had neither son nor brother. And look what happened to that alone person. There was no end to his toil. See, simply put, what this is saying is that this man, life wasn't working out. So he tried to find meaning and significance outside of relationships. He tried to adjust his focus. Well, let's see what he found. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. See, he was still not content. Even though he tried to find significance, accumulated wealth, did other things, he still was not content. And that's because he and people, you and I, were designed for relationship. We were made to be in relationship. You know, I've come to the conclusion that I cannot do life without relationship. I can't. I just can't do it. Relationships are important. They're a big deal. The relationship decisions in your life, some of the most important ones you'll have. Relationships are so, so important. Well, Pastor Samuel, that's your opinion. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. In 1 Peter, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, why don't you go ahead and underline that above all. I'm going to give you a quick Bible reading tip. Whenever you see an above all, slow down. Stop for a second. All the verses are great in the Bible, but when you see above all, you want to know what's on the other side of that above all. It's important. So let's look. So above all, love each other deeply. Love people. I think it's so interesting that when it says above all, this is important, it immediately jumps to other people. Relationships. Relationships are important. Love people deeply. Why? Well, because love covers over a multitude of sins. You know, the fact is that you could find yourself someday in a place where you could be in some trouble. And if you don't have those relationships in place, you could end up being taken advantage of. You could end up being dead meat. People will take advantage of you. You know, I want to pause here and tell a quick story. Um, A couple years back, I had the opportunity when I was in college to go for a semester and study in Rome, Italy. And let me tell you, Rome is quite a bit different from Virginia Beach, as I found out very fast. (laughs) It didn't help that I didn't speak a lick of Italian. You know, for the first couple months, I threw around Spanish words because they sounded similar, (laughs) and it never worked out. Italians would just look at me, laugh, and then start speaking in English. And I (laughs) could never win. Well, after a couple months, I ended up making some Italian friends at the university I was studying at, and they showed me the ropes. These were Mia Amici's. That's Italian for my friends, but that's all you're getting. I don't know anything else. (laughs) Mia Amici's, they they helped me out. They showed me where to get the most authentic pizza, where to get the best cappuccinos, where to get the best gelato, and so on. But they also helped me with some more serious things. You see, they helped me recognize and understand that Not all taxi drivers in Italy are safe. (laughs) Yeah, I found this out the hard way. Well, they 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 would because you know the cab, the transportation system over there, they explained, was not very well regulated. And at the time I was there, the ride sharing kind of apps and things like Uber and Lyft had just exploded. So that was just causing even more tension. They were going on strikes like every other week. The whole transportation system was kind of whacked out. So, and. These drivers, these cab drivers would take advantage of you, you know, especially because <laughs> I'm an American. They thought they could, you know, take advantage of me, which they tried to. They would charge me, not just me, uh, the other students had said this well, they would try to charge you 150 euros, which is comparable to dollars at, at that time it was, 150 euros, dollars, just to go down the street for like a $10 trip. I'm not kidding. They would really try to do that. They charge you an arm and a leg, take advantage of you. And then on top of that, there were even a few cab drivers that would drive students out to this airport because it was cheaper, it was on the outskirts of Rome, it was a smaller airport, um, and they would drive students out there, and these cab drivers were supposedly connected with the mafia. And this is not something my friends just told me, this is something, when we showed up in Italy, we had an orientation with the school the first week, and they said they had stories of students who, it never ended good when they did that because they would take advantage of them. So, one time, to save money, I decided to fly out of that airport. (laughs) Looking back, not a good idea. <laughs> but I, you know, I needed to go, and I wanted to save money, and it was a lot cheaper out of that airport. So as I was leaving, we kind of all lived in the same building as my Italian friends and other students, and I, was go- I needed to go. I was kind of actually late for my flight. I was trying to get in the cab, and I was just grabbing the first cab I saw. So I was just jumping in the cab. I already thrown my bags kind of in there, and I was getting ready to get in when one of my friends grabbed me. I didn't even know he was there. Hey, what are you doing? And I was like, what? He's like, don't get in that cab. And I'm like, what? I got to go. I'm a busy American. I got to go. 
And he looked at me and he said, don't get in that cab. If you get in that cab, you might not see Rome again. <laughs> and I looked at the driver and I kid you not, the driver said, you need to get in this cab or you're not making any flight. I was, whoa. And I looked back at my friends and they said, no, he's coming with us. We're going to take him. Get out of here. We're going to call the carabinera, which is like the police. Well, I looked at my friends and I said, you guys are my new best friends. <laughs> I'm hanging out with you all the time. See, but that's loving people. See, when we get relationships right, God designed it so people have your back. We're a team. People get your back. They take care of you. They make sure you see Rome again. <laughs> <laughs> they make sure you're okay. It's power of relationships. Well, the verse goes on to say that offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And the verse actually takes it up a level here. It says to use your gifts in the relationships you are in. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things, above all, so that in all things, above all, so that in all things, people things, relationship things, work it out things, love things, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And everybody join me in the last word. Amen. Amen. So what do we do? Okay, relationships are important. I kind of get that. What, what do I got to do? Well, we got to make some relationship decisions, some big ones. And I've put four relationship decisions that I think there's at least one each of you needs to make. Most of us, it's all four. But there's at least one on there e I guarantee you, you need to make, okay? Well, the first one, first decision is this. I have decided to nurture my important relationships. You see, God has put critical relationships in your life. He's put critical relationships in my life. He's made me a brother. He's made me a husband. He's made me a pastor. And those are critical relationships. The reason they're critical relationships is because I can't leave those relationships where they are. Let me say it this way. Anything you leave, it never stays where you left it. Any great relationship, any amazing relationship happens on purpose, not by accident. You have to work at it. You see this in marriages. It's, it happens in marriages when, you know, the husband doesn't go, well, I wined and dined her, I got her chocolate, got her roses, did the whole nine yards, and then got married and whoop, no more. No, it doesn't stay where you left it. That relationship does not stay where you left it. In fact, if you leave it, it deteriorates. It falls apart. You know, this is why the Bible, this is why Scripture uses you as an analogy to your body time and time again. And when it talks about you and relationships, it's talking about connecting. See, you're, it describes you as a body part, and you play a role in the entire body. The body doesn't work if it's not connected. We see this in Colossians. And remember, this, this verse is talking about you. The whole body, you are supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews. And you will grow as God causes it to grow. These scriptures talking about the connecting points in relationships. See, it's easy to get when we talk about the actual body. Yeah, that makes sense with the actual body. You know, I have to take care of my body. I have to exercise. I have to eat healthy. I have to get enough sleep. And if I do those things, I get to use my body a long time. If I don't, I'm probably going to be dead sooner than I thought. And then when you're dead, it's too late to start working out. Hmm, I ought to start working out. No, you're in the box. It's too late. It's over. <laughs> and what I mean by it is you just don't wait till it's dead. Same with your relationships. Strengthen them. Nurture them when there's still a chance. Don't wait too long. Do not wait too long. Let me say it this way. It's like when you have a fire. And when do you add logs to the fire? You don't wait till it's burned out. You add it when it's still hot especially for those of you in marriage. Add a log now. Don't wait. Don't come into the pastor's office with your, your marriage and say, oh, it's broken. It's in pieces. Please put it back together. No, wise is the person who comes in to the office and makes an appointment and says, I need to make an appointment. What for? Marriage counseling. Well, what's going on? Nothing. I just want to strengthen it. We're gonna, we would call everybody in. <laughs> wow, this person gets it. 
Oh my goodness, this person gets it. Big difference, add a log while it's still hot. Parents, nurture and strengthen the relationship with your kids, because before you know it, it's gone. It's gone. You know, I wanna share a story with you. This story I'm not proud of, but you know, I wanna share it with you. I want you to be a part of this life with me. Uh, so let's get vulnerable. You know, what do they say? They say that, uh, what do they say? Oh, they say confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. So here we go. I'm gonna, hopefully you guys are gracious. <laughs> well, the story starts actually when I entered high school. And entering high school, I played football kind of in middle school, but when I entered high school, I just really got into it. I really loved it, and I wanted to play in college, and that became my dream, kind of, you know, I'm gonna play in college no matter what it takes. Well, that's a good thing. You know, I still love football to this day, but at that time, I let it kind of become a priority. And it started to affect key relationships. I started to neglect key relationships for football. You see, I started spending 30 hours a week during the school years, I kid you not, doing football activities. That was my life. And then after four years of not playing but living football, I found myself playing college football, what I wanted. You know, I was playing at Christopher Newport University. And when I got on that field, for the very first time I looked up and I realized how far my brothers were from me. I have two younger brothers, and I love them, but they were far away from me at that time. And it really freaked me out because I realized it was mostly my fault. See, I put football first. I chose not to go on family trips. I chose not to spend time with them. I even let the, some of the rough culture of kind of the football and some of the tougher guys kind of bleed into me, and I was very mean to my brothers. I treated them very poorly. And, you know, I realized that they deserve so much more. They deserve my love. They deserve my time. They deserve my ears to listen to them. But that time, I didn't want anything to do with them. That's right, and I look back, and it's painful. And it really shook me because I realized, oh my goodness, I don't have as much time anymore. See, I'd moved out, and I was seeing them a fraction of the time I saw them growing up. So I vowed, I'm, I was, I'm never gonna let this happen again. I'm not gonna let this happen. So I started to intentionally try to kind of make inroads with them, to listen to them, to hear them, to take an interest in their passion and their hobbies. And, you know, I came to realize they're different than when we were little kids. But I wanted to get to know them. I, it's it's kind of like starting all over because I let it burn out. It's like starting all over. And I vowed to never again sacrifice my love for them and my relationship with them for something that's far less valuable, way less valuable. Well, I still, to this day, honestly, don't think I'm at the level of connection we had when we were kids. But with God's grace, I'm making progress. It's slow progress, it's baby steps. But those steps are so valuable. The love I have for them, so valuable. So hear it from me, learn from me. Don't wait too long. Don't wait till the fire's burned out. Add a log. Don't wait too long. Don't wait. Wow, this is good preaching, Pastor Samuel. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Number two. The second thing you have to decide is I have decided to restore some broken relationships. Restore some broken relationships. Now, I want to share something with you that I've seen time and time again, because there are some of you in here I know that have the pain of broken relationships sitting right in your gut. That's where your emotions are. It's, oh, the pain, broken relationships. But I want to tell you, I'm telling you the truth. I've seen this over and over again. The pain from unresolved conflict is much, much greater than the pain of resolving it. It's so worth it to resolve that conflict. And see, it actually is simple. You're, no, it's not simple. Well, it actually is. When you really look at it from a scripture point of view, it is. And that's because all I'm asking you to do is to do your part. They probably won't do their part. In fact, they almost definitely won't do their part. But if you do your part, it's a choice. Conflict resolution is not an event, it's a choice. And it's your choice. You have to make that decision. You know, I want you guys to do what Romans 12 says. Romans 12 says, do not repay anyone with evil. So if they're mean to me, I'm going to be mean back. No, no. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, why don't you go ahead and underline, as it depends on you, because that's the key. If you bring them into the equation, it gets complicated fast. But if it's just you, it's a single choice you make. As far as it depends on you, 
live at peace with everyone. What a great way to live. I want to live that way. You should want to live that way. Live at peace with everyone. That means you don't hold on to their wrongs. You don't make a list of how they've hurt you. You let that go. You know, it reminds me of a story of a couple. They're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And during the celebration, one of, somebody raised their hand and asked, Grandma, how did you remain faithful for 50 years? How did you do that? I said, well, it was easy. You know, when we first got married, I sat down and I decided I was going to put together a list of the top 10 things he does that irritate me. And I'm going to let him go for it. For the sake of our marriage, I'm going to overlook those things. And somebody else asked, well, what were those 10 things? And they said, you know, I never actually put the list together. There's every time he did something wrong, I thought, lucky for him, that's one of them. But why can't we live like that? We can live like that. When somebody does something wrong that irritates me, makes me angry, you're lucky. That's one of those things. You know, instead of me holding on to it, I'm going to let God hold on to it. He's the one who's going to hold on to it, not me. And if you can do this, it allows you to live happy. It allows you to live at peace, like Scripture talks about. Well, the third decision is you have to decide to sever the harmful relationships. See, there's some of you in here who have harmful relationships, whether you, you probably do know it, but you might not. These relationships, you need to sever them. You need to cut them because they will bring you down. What do I mean? Well, a flirtatious relationship at work, and you're married. That will bring you down. Cohabitating with a girlfriend or boyfriend, and you're living together. You feel, once again, in the gut, you feel, oh, well, maybe that's probably not the best. That's not God's best for me. Well, it's not. I'll tell you what to do. I don't know. You're saying, I don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell you what to do. Pull out your phones and text them. It's over. <laughs> if that's too hard, you can pull it out. In fact, you can say, Pastor Samuel says it's over. And then don't send him my number. Send him my email. I'll, I'll get around to him. <laughs> but the point is, you make the decision. It's you have to decide. Maybe you're a guy who has those friends that they're always making that kind of extra raunchy joke, this sleazy joke that, you know, that, that I really don't want that junk in my life. You have to decide that. And you're probably saying, well, that seems a little critical, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> Scripture has a ton to say about that. Proverbs, a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the cr- kind of friends he chooses. That's powerful. I tell youth all the time, I use this verse all the time, I tell youth, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's a fact. Proverbs 13, he who walks with the wise grows wise. This is why we always talk about being in groups here. That's because those groups encourage you. They support you. They pray for you. They ask you if you've been praying. They ask you what they can pray for. They're there to strengthen you as opposed to being a companion of fools. A a companion of fools looks like dead in Rome. That's what a companion of fools looks like. You don't want that. You want to grow wise. The Bible is clear, 2 Corinthians. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? This word yoked literally means common fellowship. So what does that mean? Well, that means when you're around non-Christians, it doesn't mean you go, ew, get away, nasty. No, you don't do that. It just means you guard your heart. You protect yourself. You don't let them get that close to you. That's what yoked means. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what? Fellowship can ha- light, whoa, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The obvious answer is no. It's no. They can't. So what do you do? You sever it. You cut it out. You just can't have that anymore. You know, for some of you other young people in here, the friends thing is huge. You need to look and decide. Don't let your parents dog you out for it. Oh, you shouldn't be hanging out with them. You need to look at them and decide, is that what I want my future to look like? And then you decide for yourself. That goes for everybody. Decide for yourself. Are you all getting anything? Does that make sense? You have to decide for yourself. Well, the last decision, and in my opinion, this one's the most important, is that you need to initiate some meaningful relationships. In other words, you don't have these, but you need them. Hebrews 10, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another And all the more as you see the day approaching. So, what are some of these most meaningful relationships? Well, I'm going to tell you. I got four of them for you. I think if these relationships are not happening in your life, you need to make them happen. They are vitally important. 
The first one is a relationship with the church. Now notice I didn't say go to church. I said a relationship with the church. They're different. They're hugely different. So if you're church hopping, stop it. Go somewhere and, and give it a chance. Give it a relationship. You know, and it doesn't have to be this church. I happen to love this church. It's a phenomenal church. But to be honest, if this church didn't exist, there's 10 other churches in Virginia Beach I would go to. I've had coffee with the pastors. They're phenomenal people. They're great churches. You need to be in a relationship with the church. You know, people who try Vineyard, and they say, hey, yeah, I want to try this church. Well, I, I honestly say to them, hey, if you're going to try this church, try it for real. Give it a year of relationship. What does that mean? Get in a group. Complete growth track. Serve on a team. Attend a conference. Give it a year of relationship. And at the end of the year, I promise you, you will look back to where you started. And you might not be where you want to be, but you'll look back and you'll see how far you've come. That's the power of relationship with a church. It moves you. It's powerful. We have our membership classes here at Vineyard. It's step two of Growth Track where we talk about membership. And that happens the second weekend of every month. But if you don't want to wait till November, we are actually doing an all-inclusive Growth Track next Sunday. At 1230, we're going to go through steps one through three. For s some people, that fits their schedule. But so we're going to do that, okay? And I'd like to invite you to that. Well, the second relationship that you need, also extremely important, is with a small group. Relationship with a small group. Now, we beat this drum a lot around here, but that's because we know how powerful it is. This is where authentic life change happens, is in small groups. And we work hard. Once again, you don't have to go to a small group here at Vineyard, but we work extra hard to create groups that are rooted in Vineyard values. We call it the Vineyard Network. That's why we call it that. It's a network of groups that are rooted in the Vineyard values. And we have, we've worked hard to create many different options, you know, from volleyball to prayer to men's group to women's group. You know, and wh what, do you, what happens when you go there? Well, people are going to encourage you. They're going to pray for you. They're going to want to support you. They're going to want to take care of you. They're going to get your back. They're going to want to know your name. But who doesn't want that? You know, UCLA did a study about three years ago, and they found that people, you and I, need eight to ten meaningful touches a day to remain healthy. UCLA said that, not a church. Isn't that crazy? Eight to ten meaningful touches. It's affection. So you know what? We're going to do that now. Everybody stand up and hug a stranger. No, no, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. No, no. <laughs> some of you are like, I ain't never going to this church again. <laughs> and then some wise people are like, I'm coming next week. I'm sitting next to somebody hot. <laughs> Unique people meeting strategy here. <laughs> well, no, I play, but it's, we need encouragement. We were designed to thrive off of encouragement. Words of affirmation, that helps, that feeds our soul, helps us remain healthy. And that's what happens in small groups. You know, we have so many different options, but we've put together an online directory. You know, you go to vineyardchurch.com. There's a whole online directory where you can see all, and you can actually filter down the list to a group that you want to do. You can do uh, Thursdays uh, with men in Virginia Beach. Boom, you see that group. Saturday morning prayer, a group for couples. You have a couple options. You see, but that's designed for you. And will it be awkward at first when you go? Yeah, it'll be awkward. But it's always awkward when you meet new people. After a few hours or a few weeks, those people you met will be some of the most powerful relationships you've ever had. And if you don't believe me, you can ask somebody who's in a group right now, and they'll tell you the exact same thing and some more. It's powerful. That's where life change happens. Relationship with a small group. The third one is relationship with a team. Everybody needs to be on a team. You know why? Because it's fun. <laughs> we make it fun here. You know, and we're not only having fun, but we're making a difference in people's lives at the same time. You know, the power of a team is that you can do more on a team than you could ever do by yourself. Listen to this. If you try to do life on your own and you try to make a difference by yourself, you have a limited production. Even if that's a lot, it's still limited. When you serve on a team, whether it's the greeter team, the worship team, the production team, the kids team, when you serve on a team, the sky's the limit for what you can do. You can touch so many people's lives. And that's why here at Vineyard, we call the team the dream team. And that's because it's different from volunteers. Volunteers are people who help somebody else with their vision. Here at Vineyard, we have people who are living out their vision, who are living out the gifts God has given them. That's why we call it the dream team. We dream together. So relationship with the team. 
And the final one, this is actually the, fir- the last one is the first one. It's the most important. It's a relationship with God. So why don't you write God in there and then close your eyes. I want you to notice that I said relationship, not religion. So just close your eyes and think about that. Relationship. So different from religion. And it ought to blow your minds that God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants to love you. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. That's a relationship. You know, if there's one message you would kind of walk away with today, it's that relationship is miles away from religion. It's so different. Relationship is intimate. It's fun. It's real. It's real. And that's what God wants. He wants a relationship with you. He loves you. He's shown that he loves you unconditionally, whether you've seen it or not. He has. He loves you right now where you're at. Okay, Samuel, what do I got to do? What does that mean? Well, God just wants you to love him back. That's what a relationship is. It's initiating a relationship that is love and committed, and it's real. That's what salvation is. It's just loving Jesus back when he loved us so much. Now, you might know inside that whether you have a relationship with God or not. You're the only one who knows that. You might just be attending church and going through the motions. But I'm, I want to tell you, you're missing the best part. The best part is being in relationship with God, knowing God. That's because it leaves with you when you walk out the door. A relationship with God is real. And said, all you have to do is love him. If you're here today and you want to love Jesus back or at least start to try to, then the Bible says you do that with the confession. You confess with your mouth and, mouth and you believe with your heart that Jesus loves you. So if you want to make that decision to, well, I am going to love Jesus back. And I'm going to put my, I'm going to give him my life. Now, I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to make you stand up or turn in your outline. No. I just want you to pray with me. I'll give you the words. Just mean it. Just mean it. Believe it in your heart. You say, thank you, God, for loving me first. Thank you, God. Today, I want to give you my heart, my life, my all. Forgive me of sin. Today I change direction and I choose to follow you. Come live inside of me. Make me brand new. Say these words. Be the Lord of my life. You're the number one in my life. With all of my heart, I'm going to serve you with everything. I love this phrase. Why don't you say this phrase? I give you my life. I love you. I give you my life. Lord, I thank you for every person that just prayed that prayer. I celebrate with them right now that this is the best day in their lives. It's coming into relationship with you. I just pray that you begin to press on their hearts what's happened today and what's going to continue to happen. Let them never be the same. In Jesus' name. Now, God, I am praying for the church. I'm praying that they have the courage and the wisdom to take the relational steps, to make those decisions that are hard but are so life-giving. Give them the wisdom how to fix broken relationships and the courage how to initiate some meaningful relationships. Connect them to group relationships Connect them to a church. Connect them to a team. Connect them 
so they can experience your love in a powerful way. Let the rest of this year be the best year of their life as they grow relationally with the church and with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.